Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to you. Aren't you glad you got here early and got a seat, huh? I want to welcome each one of you. We've, I know we've probably got people that are traveling today. We've uh, also got the threat of bad weather coming in, so I can understand some of the folks not being here, but if you're a visitor in the area, we, we want to welcome you to worship with us. If you're a regular attender, then we're more than happy to have you here. And uh, if you would, just take a look at your bulletins there, things that are going on. And uh, this afternoon after services, we have uh, a Christmas luncheon. Um, and then later on in the afternoon, they're going out and singing Christmas carols at, the, at a nursery home. I understand the mission last night uh, downtown was a great success. And I'm sure there's some people much happier today because you were there. So thank you so much for representing us. We'll go ahead and let's worship together. Amen. Good morning, church family. Uh, we're going to start the worship service now. I'd like to have us bow our heads for the invocation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for gathering us here together to worship you in the spirit of holiness, in reverence and humility. Please accept our praises, our songs, our prayers our worship, continue to guide us through this service. This is your day, O oh Father. This is your sanctuary, and we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. I ask you touch every heart that is here, and may we fellowship together in joy, and in warmth, and in gladness for your great gift of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Please bless this service, O Lord, and may it be to your honor and glory. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Good morning, Panama City Saints. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Would you turn to your neighbor and say happy Sabbath to the person next to you? Let's go ahead and do that real quickly. May the Lord bless you this Sabbath morning. As you may know, we are very excited for today's service. We have a very special service ahead of us, and we are reminded of the birth and, most importantly, the ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So all throughout the service, we are going to be uh, presenting different songs and uh, references to uh, Jesus Christ, and I pray that you are able to keep a prayer in your minds and in your hearts as we all participate and partake of this blessing together. Uh, the praise team is our uh, men's choir today. We're going to sing Joy to the World. You're able to sing along with us. You can find it in your hymnals and sing along with us. So let's all enjoy as we proceed with today's uh, worship service.
join us to see in this song please what child is this is god to It's a wonderful time of the year, and this is when you get to participate. So if you would, stand with me and take that hymnal in front of you and turn to hymn number 124, Away in a Manger. Away in a manger, no
now time for our offering call. Uh, just got one little thing I need to go over before I do the reading. Every week I get uh, tithe envelopes that have no names on them, which is not that big a deal. We have what's called a no-name account that uh, it goes under, but I also get a few every now and then that have a name on them, but I can't read the name. So if you don't mind, please write your name legibly. Uh, so I can read it. Uh, if you want a record of it at the end of the year, if I can't read it, you're not going to get one. And uh, with that being said, also, if you look in the back of your pews, you'll see one of these little booklets. I put them in there this morning. Uh, there's about six in every pew. They're free. Take it if you want them. Uh, I hope everybody will take one. It has to do with this time of the year and, and Jesus Christ being born. And uh, I also have a, a box with a bunch in there. So if anybody would like to go around town and give some of them out, just get with me and I'll give you a handful. And uh, I think people would appreciate it. <clears throat> also, I would like to uh, uh, thank all of those people who watch us live stream online and those who give to our church through Adventist Giving. Uh, Two or three names come to mind, Morgan Garner and, and Jonathan Green. And if you watch on Facebook and YouTube and you watch the live stream, we appreciate you watching and we appreciate you giving to our church. Uh, it's an uh, it's added blessing, you know, for this church to receive uh, tithes and offerings from people that we've never even seen before. So bless all every one of you. I just, God bless all of you and everything that you do. Uh, the Christmas story of Christ's birth in a stable includes visits by local shepherds and wise men from far distance. The shepherds, although the low-class people of Bethlehem, played a vital role for God's people, Jerusalem, located only five miles, which is eight kilometers from Bethlehem, needed the spotless lambs for daily sacrifices and many more during festivals like the Passover. These shepherds took care of the little lambs to ensure they would be in pristine enough for sacrifice. Maybe that's why the angelic host appeared to the shepherds in Bethlehem, giving them a personalized invitation to visit the spotless Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. However, the shepherds had no gift for baby Jesus. Instead, they joyfully proclaimed his arrival to the world which is recorded in Luke 2, 16 through 18. The wise men represented the other end of the social and economic spectrum. Even though they were part of the wealthy intelligentsia, <laughs> is a word, they still found themselves drawn to something far greater than themselves. Following the star, they came to Jerusalem, it shows us in Matthew 2, 1, and directly to the temple, and they were asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? Prejudiced and defensive religious leaders could point the Magi to nearby Bethlehem, but they refused to go there themselves. However, the wise men went. In fact, the wise men still seek him today. And they worshiped and gave gifts. And that's what we are here to do. This Sabbath, each of you are invited to worship and to give your gifts just like the wise men thousands of years ago. Our offering today is for the local church budget. Will the deacons come forward? And uh, we all know what uh, the church budget does. It uh, pays all of the bills that it takes to run the church. And uh, we appreciate everyone who gives to the local budget. It's probably one of the most important offerings that you can give to. And as treasurer, I appreciate it, every one of you. Uh, God bless all of you. Uh, with that being said, bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for being here with us today. Thank you for bringing each person here safely. 
And Father, I ask here today that you bless each of my brothers and sisters in whatever they do. I ask that you bless these funds that we're about to receive, that they are used for whatever the purposes they, they are given for, which is, uh, in this instance, the local budget. And help us, Lord, to give everything we do to, uh, to show our stewardship, not only monetarily, but in other ways, and to do everything we can according to your will every day of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. know, Mary saw an angel, and the angel told her that she was going to have a baby boy, and he became very special to us. And something we forget is that Mary represents the church, and that you and I can share in the blessings that Mary was given. So I invite you to kneel with me, and we'll sing our song, and then we'll have prayer together. And I'm going to um, pattern my prayer after Mary's prayer in Luke 2. Or, sorry, Luke 1. Thank you. Please kneel with me.
And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Father in heaven, may our hearts magnify you today. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Lord, we rejoice today because of all you have done to save us. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. Father, you have looked down on us on this earth and seen our need and that we had no one to save us, Lord. And yet, you regard us, even us, a little small dot in a huge universe you cared. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We don't deserve this, but yet the entire universe will call us blessed, Lord. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Amen. Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, Amen. to conquer for us. And Lord, may we be a part of your army here on this earth. And may we watch you do great things, Lord. Holy, 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 the angels sing. For his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Amen. Father, may we honor you and praise you with all that we do. May we fear you. May we be afraid, Lord, to trust any other source in every generation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The Bible tells us in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, Bethlehem Ephrata, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity and from eternity. One more time, Panama City Saints, may the Lord bless you. I pray that you are having a happy Sabbath. And if you are grateful for uh, Jesus Christ in your life, would you say amen? amen. Would you say hallelujah? Would you say glory be, to God? glory be to God? Praise the Lord. What a great blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord in this special service in which we commemorate and celebrate Jesus Christ, um, his ministry, and uh, what he does for us currently in the heavenly sanctuary. I do have a couple of um, uh, friends that I would like to acknowledge their presence. I may not pronounce these names accurately, but please bear with me and know that I do it with the the best of my ability, I would like to uplift and just say welcome to Kendall Hill and also to Dog and Merida and Elisa and Randy and Senia and Bob and um, Tim and um, the England family and to all of our friends and visitors, people who have come and traveled a long way to be here with us. So Panama City Saints, may we just acknowledge the presence of our friends and visitors here in our church. May the Lord bless you and be with you. Also to our online audience, I do see that Grace is there and so many others. Uh, bless you, uh, saints. Uh, thank you for being with us. And if you are a Facebook user, go on Facebook right now and share the service so that others may be able to participate of today's blessing. I do see Sister Gina and Janet and Judith and uh, Grace, like I said before, Ryan is always with us. To all of you guys, be blessed this Sabbath morning. We are going to proceed with a couple of announcements. Uh, hopefully you realize in your bulletin that we have a very special occasion right after the service. We are going to have the last, the very last fellowship meal or potluck of the year, right? You do not want to miss this one. Please come. Everything is prepared. Uh, we've made uh, uh, enough preparations and um, provision for everyone, whether you brought something or not. It doesn't matter. Just come. And maybe you're hesitant a little bit because, you know, this is your first, your second time. This is for you. You are the reason why we do this. So we want to see you there. 
just come and join us, and hopefully you're able to enjoy this time of fellowship. As I always say, it's not about uh, the food, because we all have food. Praise the Lord for that. It's about the people. Tell your, tell, tell your neighbor, it's about the people. It's about the people. It's about spending this time. It's about just uh, connecting and getting to know one another. On another note, we have a very special event this afternoon at 3 p.m. In your bulletin, the address that is being provided is not the correct address. So if you would like to go Christmas caroling with us to a very special place and just uh, share Jesus with others, please touch bases with me, with anyone that you may see wearing black, right? Uh, one of our elders or deacons, and um, uh, ask the question. And Sister Sharon, as our community service leader, uh, she will provide you with the right address so that you are able to participate. We encourage you to continue to pray for the sick ones in our midst, all the people who uh, daily they bring uh, prayer requests into our attention. Uh, this church is known for being a praying church. Would you say amen to that? So Sister Sandra uh, is more than uh, happy to assist you with that. And if you have any prayer requests, there's a prayer box in the foyer. Uh, grab a sheet of paper, write your request. It can be confidential, that's okay. And deposit such a prayer request in our prayer box. We pray for those often. And also emails are sent out for and text messages whenever you are in need of prayer. We would love to pray with you and for you, so we encourage you to partake of that blessing as well. Again, today we uh, celebrate our Christmas service, and I encourage you to continue to be in an attitude of worship and also an attitude of joy because Jesus Christ is born. Would you say amen? Amen. amen. So I encourage you to move forward in worship. We're going to say at the count of three, we connect, we equip, and we grow. One, two, and three. We connect, we equip, and we grow. So let's move forward in worship, Panama City Saints. waits for a miracle the heart longs for a little bit of hope oh come oh come Emmanuel a child prays for peace on earth she's calling out from a sea of hurt oh come oh come Emmanuel
Emmanuel. Porque un niño no es nacido, hijo no es dado, y el principiado sobre su hombro, y se llamará su nombre, admirable, consejero, Dios fuerte, Padre eterno, príncipe de paz. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of, and Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, verse 6. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. God, this Sabbath morning our hearts are filled with the joy of knowing that you are with us. You were born in a manger. You walked the dusty streets of Galilee. You were crucified. You were buried. But on the third day you resurrected. Amen. You ascended into heaven and now you intercede on our behalf. And we worship you and love you because of it. So as we are reminded of your birth today, we ask that you may speak to us, that you may lead us to all truth, and may this message be a blessing for more than one in this congregation. I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people say, amen. amen. You may be seated. Raise your hand if you were here last week, last Sabbath. Raise your hand if you were, right? We were blessed with a powerful message from the Lord. So I encourage you, just like I said before, to remain in an attitude of prayer as we discuss the matter for this morning. Have you ever considered that the average American spends a minimum of five years in their lifetime just waiting? Have you ever thought of that? Let's say you, someone lives 70, 75, 80 years, right? Out of those 80 years, five of them, is, does that sound like a long time? Five years waiting, and it's a fact. Depending on uh, their lifestyle, some individuals waste valuable time standing at check-in counters, right? Right? You wait, and you're just there. You're ready to go home, and then there's a, a long line in front of you. You may be waiting to be seated at a restaurant table and you spend time in that uh, um, foyer waiting to be accommodated. You also have to navigate lines when you, whenever you go to the DMV office. Have you been there in one of those, right? Those are the worst at times. You have to wait and wait and wait. Think about that for just a moment. It seems that wherever we go, we inevitably encounter lines which are synonymous for a waiting experience. Raise, raise your hand if you like waiting. Raise your hand. If you do, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> because I doubt it. Most of us are subscribed to something called Amazon Prime because we don't want to wait the four or five days that they commit to. So we are willing to pay extra so that they are able to deliver in two days, right? So waiting is the worst. Each day brings with it the endurance of lengthy lines or lengthy lines at places like airports. Have you traveled over the holidays before? Have you traveled? What happens with those lines? Mm -mm, mm -mm. If you want to go to an amusement park, to a hospital, to a stadium, even to a public restroom, right? Sometimes you're, you're making this trip from here to, you know, Alabama. I, I, I met someone in the foyer who came from Berrien Springs, right? 
I imagine that he uh, uh, must stopped several times. And he had to use, you know, the restroom and they, uh, there they are, lines and more lines. So the, the, the research tells that we spend five years of our lives waiting. And that sounds like a huge time. Every visit to the doctor adds up to at least 32 minutes of waiting, right? If you go to the doctor frequently, you know that it's at least half an hour of waiting. And perhaps the most intriguing statistic is that Americans spend, listen to this, if you've missed, if you, if you've missed all the others, this is the, the, the one that I want you to consider. The, the most intriguing statistic is that Americans spend 21 minutes on average waiting whenever they have to step out. What I mean by that is that if you're going out with your spouse, right, the average time for waiting is 21 minutes. Now, I'm going to stay out of a minefield right here, and I'm not going to say anything else about it. I'm going to let you be the one who decides who is responsible in your relationship for those 21 crucial minutes that are spent, right? So you can, uh, <laughs> you can turn to your wife or to your husband very nicely and offer a smile, and he or she may know what that means. But my point as we uh, uh, start off this uh, sermon today is that we spend so much time waiting, Especially when this waiting time is coupled with certain expectations, right? You're waiting for something and you really want it, you're longing for, you know, so it, it gets a little rough. Now, the Bible unfolds a narrative of waiting. The Bible tells the story of a waiting period. You can see scattered all throughout Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, and you will see instances and examples that exemplify, right, different instances in which people were waiting and waiting and, and patiently they were challenged because they anticipated something that they thought it was going to come quick, and that was not the case because God had other plans. So was the case with Noah, right? Noah exemplified the virtue of waiting, dedicating many, many years to the building of an ark, and while waiting for the flood, he thought, or most of his contemporaries thought, that this was just a story. And they got tired of waiting and they uh, uh, stopped and ceased waiting altogether. So Noah is a prime example of waiting in Scripture. Also, we have Abraham and Sarah's uh, journey. They, they, they uh, uh, waited for a prolonged time for this baby who was promised to them, right? Right? Several decades, and they waited and waited and waited for the birth of a son. Joseph, right? Another instance of someone who waited amidst a false accusation. He waited, not like you and I are waiting. He waited in prison, right? False accused. His circumstances was very difficult, and yet he experienced an extended period of endurance. So Joseph, too, had to wait. The Israelites... God promised the, the Cain and the promised land, right? And they had to wait it years, 40 years, waiting and wandering throughout the wilderness. They waited and waited and waited. But if you want to talk about waiting, how about Job? Right? He waited in his suffering with no explanation or whatsoever. He just was condemned to wait and wait all the more. So the Bible unfolds. It reveals uh, several narratives in which waiting is the key component of someone's spiritual walk. Yet the paramount story of waiting is none of, uh, none of the ones that I have uh, presented before, but one who was so, di so, so important and so long, at least 7,000 years, right? 7,000 years of waiting. It got started in the Old Testament, and then the waiting extended, and it is not only until the New Testament when 400 years of silence where there was no prophetic voice in Israel took place and people were waiting and they waited all the more and they waited even more and some of them even uh, lost faith about this waiting period. 
But ultimately, one day, the promise was fulfilled. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name, how? Emmanuel. Everybody say Emmanuel. From this point in which Isaiah prophesies about this son, 700 years later until it was ultimately accomplished. So today's message explores the ramifications of the question, what child is this? What child is this that we have to wait this long? Who is this child, right? In what circumstances this baby was born for this was not an ordinary child, right? I think, Jacob, you deal with delivering child. Is that what you do? What is the, 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 the average time, according to my research, is 37 weeks, 38, 40 weeks, right? At the most, 40 weeks waiting for a child. Now compare 40 weeks with over 400 years. How does that sound? And it was not only that. This baby was so different, it was so unique, it was so special that uh, uh, his parents did not need a, a, re a gender reveal kind of party, right? Nowadays, you see online all of these people gathering together, going to a friend's house, a close uh, a family friends are there and family members. And they have, you know, the, 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 the balloons and the sparkling juice and pictures and cameras recording all the way. You, you know how it is, right? And they have this blue powder, right? And they have this pink powder, Right? And, and there's great expectation when people are waiting. You, you guys went through this experience, right, not too long ago. You can see Nathan right here. Nate, right? Nate? I, I hope that people are able to see Nate. How old is he now? A month. He's a month old. He's the newest member of our church, right? And I remember when we had a little gathering. Yeah, you can see Nate right here. <laughs> yes, yes. So we're glad you guys are here. But, but this whole thing about revealing a baby's gender has become a thing in our culture, right? And whenever the balloon explodes and the blue powder is all over the place and people get uh, so much into excitement and they celebrate together. Now we know this baby, but guess what? For the baby in Isaiah 7, 14, the angel of the Lord spoiled all the fun, Right? Because he told way in advance that it was going to be a son, right? So no need for a, a baby reveal, a gender reveal or nothing like that. He prophesied his name, the angel did. He prophesied his gender, right? Emmanuel, he prophesied his life mission. He prophesied what this baby would be. So who is this baby? What child is this? Now, the Bible is very specific in terms of providing information about this baby, okay? So, uh, as you can see, uh, please just join me in the book of Matthew, uh, call, uh, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Matthew 1, 18. If you have your Bibles, please join me there and say amen whenever you get there. If you do not have a Bible... Grab one from the pews in front of you or just open up your device. Hopefully you're not distracted. And go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. The Bible is very specific describing the way that this baby was born. And it says in Matthew 1, 18, say amen when you have it. Amen. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away, how? Secretly, right? You guys know the story. Verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold... An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. 
and she will bring and, the, and she will bring forth a son, right? And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. We just read from Isaiah, right? So this is the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given years before. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated is what? God with us, right? So the expectation for this baby was great. His name was revealed. His gender was revealed. His mission was revealed. What he, what, what he was meant to be was revealed. But what child is this? Conceived by the Holy Spirit. Destined to save his people. Acting as a reminder of God's presence with humanity. You know... This is something very, very special. Because the Bible... Is able to answer all of our questions. Could you say amen? amen? In scripture you can find what child is this. And the same messenger who provides the prophecy to set forth. Who is it that this child will be also provides the description of who he is. So I encourage you to go back now to the Old Testament. And find me in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. A unique child. Very awaited, filled with anticipation, but conceived by the Holy Spirit, acting as a reminder of God with us. Who is this child? What child is this? Well, Isaiah himself answers in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Can we all read it together? Isaiah 9, 6. Let us all read together. 1, 2, and 3, it goes. For unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Would you say amen? amen. Raise your hand if you've read this passage before, this text, right? You know, there's a lot of debate in regards to this passage. Here Isaiah provides a description of the character and nature of this baby. And he provides, according to scholars, there's a huge debate because there's scholars that say that he, they provide, Isaiah provides five titles. How many titles? Five titles. Can you tell me the five titles? You have them in there. Tell me. Wonderful. Wonderful. What else? Counselor. Counselor. What else? Mighty God. What else? Everlasting Father. What else? How many titles? Five. The debate is that some scholars believe that instead of five, there are just four. Okay? There's just four. I'm a little inclined to the four theory. This is not a matter of salvation, so I'm just going to share the, uh, my research with you and you make your own mind. Okay? Here's the deal. First and foremost, Isaiah wrote in Hebrew. Right? The Old Testament was written in its majority in the Hebrew language, right? And we do not have such thing as a coma in the Hebrew, right? So the fact that we have a coma between wonderful and counselor, you see that? There's a coma in there. Between wonderful and counselor is just an interpretative uh, choice. Does that make sense, right? So that coma is not included in what we consider the Word of God. Are you, are you guys with me? So that's number one. Number two... You have all the other three titles. What are the others? Mighty. Mighty God. What's the other one? Everlasting. Everlasting Father. And what's the other, the other one? So you have three titles with two words. Yes or no? Yes or no? So it just makes sense for some people that wonderful counselor is one title in itself. If you go to the NIV and some other translations, you will see that it's just a taste and a choice that some of the translators make. So we're going to roll with my research so far and, my <laughs> and, and what I propose. But again, it's not a matter of uh, salvation here. So let's say that Isaiah provides four titles. Would that be okay? Four titles. 
Let's repeat them one more time. Wonderful what? Counselor is the first one. Then we have mighty God. Then we have everlasting God or Father. And then we have Prince of Peace. So let's talk a little bit about all four of these. Because they are the ones who answer the question, what child is this? What is it that makes this child this special that we have to wait over 400 years? Is it true that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, right? Is it true that he's just the living manifestation that God is with us, right? Who is this child? Well, wonderful counselor. This is the initial designation of the child and unveils the extraordinary nature of his being, right? In essence, what, I'd say, what I say I say in here is that this child is a miracle gift from God, right? Wonderful counselor. Would you say amen? amen. Right? The Hebrew term for, for wonderful is pele. Everybody say pele. Amen. Pele is a Hebrew word that is used over 15 times throughout the Old Testament whenever a mighty act from God is perceived in the Old Testament. So let's say that God came and he delivered the people of Israel from the Egyptian yoke. Are you guys with me? Right? With a strong hand, the Bible says, so that strong hand in uh, the Hebrew is Pele, right? Whenever there's a wonderful act of power, a wonderful act of miracle in the midst of God's people, that's where Pele is used. So this Pele, uh, uh, to be, to, to be uh, uh, designated to this child, is telling me that this wonderful idea or wonderful term that is used is to say that this child is powerful. Would you say Amen. This is a powerful child that wonderful talks volumes about the mighty of God or the might of God of the child, right? So that's number one. But uh, what is the use of power if you don't know how to use it? Is that a dangerous sin thing? Absolutely. So the Bible tells us that this wonderful might and authority and power and acts of liberation from this child are attached to the idea that he's also a counselor. Are you guys with me? And the counselor aspect of this first title is tied into the wisdom that he possesses, right? In other words, in biblical times, you had, uh, let's, let's talk about the, the kings of Judah. You have Zedekiah, for instance. Can you remember any other of the, 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 the kings of Judah? Zedekiah and also the, the, the northern kingdom. You remember those very difficult names, right? All of them, they had what they call a, 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 a committee of counselors, right? And they came into this particular committee whenever they needed some advice. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar, right, in the book of Daniel? What did he do? He went to his, you know, committee of, of wise men and counselors and people to, 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 to help him, you know, uh, 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 explain the prophecy, right? So this was very normal in biblical times. So the fact that this child is called wonderful, mighty, uh, uh, authoritative counselor is to say that he's not only powerful, but he's also wise. He has the understanding. He has the wisdom. He has the way to use such a power. Amen. So this mighty child is not only a king, it's a powerful king. It's a wise king that knows how to use the power that he's been bestowed. Would you say amen? amen. Wonderful counselor. What's the second, the second uh, uh, um, uh, uh, title that is provided? Mighty God, right? Mighty God. In the Hebrew, mighty God is El Gibor. Everybody say El Gibor. El is the Hebrew word for God. We have El in Ezekiel. Tell me a biblical name with El. Ezekiel. Daniel. What else? Well, Elijah. Samuel, right? All of those are different forms of God, right? God is my strength. You know, God is my peace. You may find those in, uh, in, in a concordance. By the way, on a side note, the reason why my oldest son is called Eddie L is because of this, right? Many people ask me like, what, what, Eddie L, what's that? You know, it's Eddie and God. Eddie L, God, right? It just makes sense, right? 
So Ediel, we have Edi and God. The same thing, El Gibor is a straight connection with Emmanuel, right? Are you guys with me? So mighty God, El Gibor, is that this God, El, right, that is Emmanuel, that is with us, is Gibor. What does Gibor mean? Gibor is the word for uh, the description of a warrior, a hero in biblical times, right? You may be the most powerful person on earth. What is power if you don't know how to use it? So wonderful counselor. What is power if you, if you are not inclined or able or willing to use it? Does that make sense? So El Gibor is saying this is a, a, a powerful and, and wise ruler and king. He has the, 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 the authority to do it. But this God is also willing to fight on your behalf. Glory be to God. El Gibor. Right? I do remember from uh, the Old Testament stories, right? And the people of God came to Samuel and they said, we want a king like the surrounding nations. Raise your hand if you remember that. We want a king like the surrounding nations to rule over us. And the Bible tells us that they said to fight our battles. Do you remember that? To protect us, to provide for us. Because El Givor is that idea of fighting uh, and heroes and protection, which is the primary sense that, 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 that I say is trying to communicate here. So we have our first and second designations and titles already. Which one is the first one? Wonderful? Counselor. I cannot hear you. Wonderful? And the second one? Mighty? Mighty God, El Gibor. So historically, this title carries the weight of a warrior and a hero. Now, the third one is everlasting father. In the ancient world, just like I said before, fathers or kings often were a mirror to fathers, to their people. And this is what I mentioned before, right? We want a king, right? We want a father. We want someone who, who fights our, our, our battles for us. Now, unlike the limitations of early fathers, this prophesied child is depicted as an eternal father. Right? Many of us here in this room, we've lost our earthly father. We have, right? Many of us. But what a great blessing it is to know that this child that is prophesied and that was to be born will be a father and a king, a provider, and someone who deeply care for his people, for his children, not only at the beginning of time, not only in the midst of time, but also for eternity. Would you say amen? Everlasting father. The aspect of this baby to be a provider and a sustainer to his people. Now the fourth and last title that is provided in Isaiah 9, 6 is what? Prince of what? Prince of peace. Prince of peace. The promised child is not only destined to be a peaceful prince, but also a sovereign ruler who reigns in peace. Are you guys with me? You know, if you've lived long enough to go over different, you know, political changes in our nation and in the world, you may realize that more often than not, everyone who comes into the political picture offers some shape or some form of peace, right? This is what, this is what we do. And we're leaders, they go around and they try to, we're doing this to guarantee peace, Right? We're doing these things so that the world may have peace, right? Are they able to come through with that promise? Would you say yes or no? Absolutely not, right? At the most, they're able to exercise a couple of years, a couple of months. What is a long period of time with peace? Tell me, you tell me. Is, is it four years, a long period of time with peace? How about 500 years? Is that a long time of period of peace? Okay, have you ever heard of La Pax Romana? Roman peace, right? The Romans for 500 years, they became the greatest nation on the earth, right? 
And they were able to establish, you know, a, a set of roads to communicate the known world back in, in the days, right? After uh, the, 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 uh, the Greeks, they came and they communicated uh, all, all the, the, the routes in, 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 in the ancient world. And they were able to establish a kingdom that was so great. A kingdom that was so powerful that his, challenge, his, his authority was never challenged for 500 years. That sounds like a long time. Yes or no? However, are they here with us today to guarantee such a peace? Right? So the point that Isaiah is trying to make in his fourth title is that this baby that will be born that is prophesied is not only a wonderful counselor. It's not only that he has the power, he has the authority. It's not only that he's a warrior and a hero. It's not only that he will be the provider forever, but he will be the ultimate fulfillment of eternal peace for this world. Can you say amen? amen. Not four years, not 500 years, for eternity. It is this baby born in a manger coming unto us. And just like he said, a child is born to offer eternal peace. Isaiah decisively answers the question, what child is this? And he declares that this baby that is to be born was going to be the ruler of the world. Would you say amen? amen? He was going to be destined to reign with wisdom, with power, and with the peace that only comes from God. However, turn to your neighbor and say, however. Each of us, you and you, and you, and me, in our own unique way, in our own fashion, we must respond the same question that Isaiah responded. And that is, what child is this? Who is it that was born? You know, the Bible tells us several characters or people who responded to the birth of this child. We have Mary and Joseph, right, who responded in awe and admiration, recognizing that this child was going to be the savior of the world, right? So they were excited, and they said, wow, what a great opportunity. Their joy and wonder turned into adoration as they, are, as they marvel in both his person and his mission. So Joseph and Mary responded in awe and adoration, similarly the shepherds uh, in the field, they humble and, and, and they as ordinary individuals, they were working and they were the recipients of the angel's proclamation. And when the heavenly hosts appeared to them, they declared the birth of Jesus and the shepherd well filled with astonishment, right? And such an astonishment, they answer the question, what child is this themselves doing something? And they will move into action. We need to go and adore and worship and find this child because he is the savior of the world. So they witness the fulfillment of the angel's words in that stable in Bethlehem. So not only Joseph of Mary, but also the shepherds in the fields, they all answered for themselves the question that this child was indeed the savior of the world the question what child is this not only resonated among earthly beings but also steered up the celestial realm would you say amen, amen. for not only mary and joseph the shepherds but also the angels themselves proclaim the answer with resounding joy, announcing the long-awaited arrival of the Savior, right? And the angels rejoiced. Their presence in the night sky, coupled with their declaration to the shepherds, underscored the divine significance of the moment. They were excited, with awe and expectations. The angels proclaimed, and they served only 
as the source of all for Mary and Joseph. But heavenly heralds of God saw the unfolding of the redemptive plan for earth. Their announcement carried a profound sense of divine joy and purpose because of the birth of the Messiah. I conclude with a question for you this morning. What child is this for you? A follow-up question will be, what are you going to do about this child? Are you going to respond in a very passive way? Or is he going to stir up your heart just like Mary and Joseph in adoration and worship? Are you going to rejoice in astonishment just like the, sh the shepherds? Are you going to proclaim wholeheartedly just like the angels that Jesus Christ is born? There's a very familiar song that says, Go tell it where? On the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. That what? That Jesus Christ is born. I remind you that whether you're dealing with a long waiting period, maybe five years you've been waiting for this declaration of joy and peace in your life. You've waited, we've waited more than 21 minutes to be ready. It doesn't matter how long the wait. It doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter what you are dealing with right now. What it does matter is that this child has promised to be a wonderful counselor for you this morning. Will you say amen? amen? He's promised to be a mighty God, a warrior ready to go to war for you. Someone who has the wisdom but also the authority to do something about your situation. I pray that you may be able to remind it, to be reminded that his promise. He has promised to give you everlasting provision as your father. Whatever, whatever you lack, the Lord is able to provide it for you. Lastly, he's promised to give you, and not only you, internal peace, but also to bring about peace into a dying world. So my question to you is, are you ready to admit and accept that this child is the Savior of the world? Would you raise your hand with me? Let us all stand and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Let us pray. Dear God, this Sabbath morning as we celebrate your birth, Lord, we are excited because of who you are. You are a wonderful counselor for us. You are a mighty God. You are an everlasting Father. You are our Prince of Peace. So now, just like Mary and Joseph, and the shepherds and the angels, Lord, may we declare with joy that you are the Savior of this world. May we live our lives knowing, Lord, that the reason for the season is you. You are, Lord. Although we may stand, Lord, in this situation, May we take advantage of this opportunity to be reminded of the greatest miracle that this world has ever seen. And may this reality help us to be ready for your second coming. The first time you came as a baby, Lord, wrapped 
in a very humble way. But we know for a fact that you are coming now as a reigning king, Lord, with the shout of a trumpet. And every eye will see and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are our Savior. So I pray, Lord, that as we go about our holidays, that we're able to be reminded that it's all about you. Thank you for being our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, and our Prince of Peace. I pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. And if you will take your hymnals and turn with number to number 142 in your hymnals, Angels, we have heard on high as a shepherd sang. Number 142.
bow our heads for closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the message we've heard. Thank you for the time and the season. Lord, we pray as we go forth from here that we can continue to praise your name and that we can share with others your glorious and wonderful message. We pray in thy precious name. Amen. Please be seated.